Keith Livingston here from Healthy Intelligent Training. I'm here tonight with Jill Boltz. Jill is formerly Jill Hunter, correct? That is correct, yes. Now married to Danny Boltz. I don't know whether that's a fortunate thing or an unfortunate thing. I lost a bet. You lost a bet? Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell us about that, Jill. <laughs> maybe maybe in another, uh, another time, after hours. I do know that uh, you were a world-class runner yourself. It's funny when people say that. I didn't really see myself as a world-class runner because I did well. But at champ when we went to championships, I always saw the thought that people who were world-class were the ones who got the medals. Um, and I, I always got to the final, but other than the Commonwealth Games, I never actually won a medal. I don't think I quite had that belief in myself back then. Um, so it's funny when you say I'm world class, but thank well, you. Well, a world's best time at the time, wasn't it, for 10 miles? Yeah, I, I had two. I had 10 mile and 25k, so... Well, that's world class. Yeah. Like any woman who can run 51 minutes and bits <laughs> 10 miles is, is seriously good. So you were coached by the great Harry Wilson. So can you tell us a bit about training with Harry and what he was like as a coach and his main <laughs> principles? So I met Harry, he was um, training a friend of mine, Kirsty Wade, and she'd won the 8 and 1500 at Commonwealth so twice. Um, and I was getting coached by a local guy and he felt that I needed to go on to somebody who had a bit more experience. So we met up with Harry and, and we just clicked. Um, the way Harry, his, his mileage with me wasn't that high. So probably average 75 mile a week. Um, but we did three quality sessions, um, one gym session, which he would have liked me to progress more, but I started to get hurt. So maybe I should have done more gym sessions earlier on, but whatever Harry said to me, I believed if he said I could do it, I would do it. And um, so if he would question one of my, if it, oh, well, not question, but if he would say one of my, um, opponents was in good shape, I think that went against me so he learned it's it, any coaching it's it's a learning experience so he knew what to say and when to say it um but yeah i couldn't i could not doubt harry at all so good and a lot of fun <laughs> yeah yeah so he, he he went out of his way to make training fun he was approachable yeah um very knowledgeable i take it yeah and like steve ovet sometimes he would be in our group but like everybody was equal like if steve would give him some stick and um, like oh i've just won the olympics or what have you go all right you're clear enough today we'll have none of that we're all the same so like nobody was made to feel special and um, we were all equal out there the young tyro back on a level pegging that's right yeah <laughs> I think he's a marvellous athlete, Steve Ovet. Yeah, he was pretty good, wasn't he? Oh, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> he did all right. You and Danny got together uh, years ago. Um, and the first time I met him, he wasn't really that fit. And we both raced in Florida, Gainesville. And yeah. I actually, I think I actually beat him in the race. I won the race. And I think he was just using the race as a... Um, a stop between places so like you get your travel paid and you get the hotel or what have you yeah so that was the first time i met him um and then from there like he's just friendly isn't he? he's fun a bit like so he was a good guy to hang out with and then then he came over to albuquerque and when he wasn't fit he would train with me um but as he got fitter obviously i couldn't train with him yeah, it's sensible not to probably some really really very good women get into trouble training with guys aerobically um yeah well harry used to he didn't like that because he used to always think that was one of my downfalls i would do my easy runs too hard because i thought everything had to be like at six minute pace so um for my easy runs i think that's like 345 for the keys and um, uh, 343 i'm afraid is it 343 there you go um so six minute pace and, that, and i think I, oh god why can't i run six minute pace every time so Harry would like, no, you've got to slow down. Um, but it took a while for me to get to that point. And I think that's confidence as well. Yeah. Um, knowing that the easy days have to be easy in order to get the most out of the hard days. Um, 
I don't know how the kids do it these days, you know, like with Strava and everything, when they're comparing against one another. So unless you've got somebody there constantly telling you, you know, this is what you do and you've got to believe in it. Um, there's too many outside influences, I think, these days. This is exactly what I want to hear because uh, I come from a place where uh, Lydia based, where easy is best. Yep. And um, what we are finding is that, um, you know, too many kids train too hard, too young. Yeah. Don't progress because they're worn out. And exactly, yeah. Back in England, there's the Harriers. So nearly every little town's got a Harriers. Um, but we were very lucky with our coach. We got results. We went to nationals, but like I wasn't that good. Um, and their philosophy was to keep us in the sport. So when we were seniors, hopefully we'd still be running, um, which was a big risk because most kids if they haven't got the results, they're lost to the sport. But then again, on the other side, if they get the results, they've got nowhere to go. So for me, that was perfect. Um, and then you go on to, like Harry took us on, and then there was plenty of room with me to, for him to develop me into a better athlete. Because um, I hadn't done all those Ks and, or, and the mega mileage, the, or the Ks, the, the big sessions. Um, and I hadn't had the, the results from the races, which... I was still like striving for, so I was still hungry when I got to Harry. You've got your own training group there in, in Cairns, correct? Yep, that's right. Yep. Tell me a bit more about that. Train them the way that I was, so like always leave them wanting for more and know that they, each year they're going to develop from the year prior. Um, and I'm constantly telling them not to compare themselves to what the other kids are doing. You know, everybody's different. There's, Running's pretty simple, um, and you don't have to overdo it. You each year just build on the year before, and um, a lot of them do want to go on and run as seniors, um, which is exciting to me, because um, it's. I think it's easy to get results out of a young kid if you, you know, <laughs> you can just you can overtrain them obviously, and they'll be like around for two years, and then you'll not see them again. But that's not what I want. I want them to like be in the sport for life doesn't matter if they don't go on and be anything but just have that passion for running to enjoy it um, and hopefully get better each year and whatever their best is then that's all that matters to me uh, we've got a good group there's about um well, we've got two groups there's one in Cairns and one in Townsville um so there's about 80 kids over the two groups um and we've still got a probably out of the 80 there'll still be 30 over that 15, 15 and older, because that's the age group I want to like keep. What's the main principle that you um, espouse uh, with the kids? Is, is, is it very similar? Like you were saying before, it's based on what you grew up with, with, with Harry and his way of coaching. So what was Harry's main principle? Um, or if there was a main principle, was it steady state running? Because I know Steve event, uh, eventually got up to some pretty impressive steady state mileage. Yeah, well, I think Steve always did lots of mileage. Um, so, like I say, we only did like 75, 80. Um, but he was, well, I shouldn't say he was, but we, um, he was always a lot more than that, even though he was only running 8 and 1500s. Um, Harry always gave us a day off every week. So we had six days. Um, out of those six days, you would train twice, five of the days. And Friday was always a day off. Um, just... He just wanted us just to recharge our batteries. So when we were training hard, we, we were ready for it. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, they were your sessions. Sunday was your long run. Monday, Wednesday was just um, double days easy. Yeah. Um, and how, like, I was more that longer distance. But he would ne he never, he always said, never neglect your speed, even though you don't think you're that fast, you never neglect the speed that you have. So after long runs, we would do strides, we'd do drills. Um, so I, I try to incorporate all that. Just sometimes there's not enough days in the week, yeah. and especially with the kids. You don't want to like overload them, tell them to do everything. So each year we'll introduce something different. Um, we do, I do a lot more conditioning with them than I ever did because I got hurt probably once I turned 24, I was on and off getting injured all the time. So, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm learning from all the mistakes I made. So I think um, that's good. It's 
good thing. I'll take that on. <laughs> I'm wondering why you'd be doing your, your leg speed runs after a long run. Why, why wouldn't you do short, fast stuff before? So, always get to get used to running fast on tired legs. That was Harry's oh, philosophy. Okay. Um, and always you think there's nothing left in the tank, but there's always something left there. So we, that was like race prep. Um, so you, like, you know, you're out there and you think you've got nothing else to give, but he'd say like, imagine if somebody was after you with a gun or what have you, you'd find something else. That's why we're doing it, you know, the strides <laughs> after a run. There's always something else there. Yeah. Um, so, and it's surprising, there is always something else there. Um, because I remember the first time I went to World Cross Country and I thought, because he used to say the first time at any level, um, it's just experience. And then my first time at World Cross Country, he goes, um, all right, top 10. I went, oh, what? He goes, yeah, you can do it. And so whatever he said, I go, okay, top 10. And I came ninth. But, you know, <laughs> the little things that he says, you go, okay, yeah, okay, I can do that. You got ninth in your first World Cross Country, but you're not world class. No. <laughs> With the kids you, you're coaching, have you got some promising ones? Well, you'd like to think you have, but it's it's hard to say. You don't really want to put that pressure on them. Um, but there's like one of the girls, she's she got scholarship to all Miss. So, you know, that's exciting for the kids that are coming up. They can see that they can get their education paid out of it. Um, and there's another boy, like he won, he got two, like track and field and cross country state champs last year. So he probably would have went to the States, but now with COVID, that's all on hold. So things like that, that gives the, the kids coming through something to aim for, that it's, you know, there's a life, you can make a life out of running. Mm. If you decide to go that path. It's, it's fantastic for the kids now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. Very, it's very good, the opportunities. But I, I'm not sure, like, I think it's very hard in Australia for the kids. It's a big jump from when they leave school to the transition to the seniors. And um, I know in England there was a lot more opportunities and the funding, I don't know what it's like now, but it was better because you, you, you were looked after. Um, and there was races for under 23s and what have you, whereas now it doesn't, once you leave school, there doesn't seem that much for the kids here until they've reached that senior level. So maybe that's why a lot of them go to the States. I uh, help a friend of mine uh, coach a college or a secondary school squad in Melbourne, uh, just yeah. by proxy. And uh, he managed to get one of his kids who was 16 on a cross country based program yeah. uh, down to 348.6 for 1500. Ooh, and, yeah, that's all right. That's and he also won the World Schoolboys Cross Country Championships, clearing out from some Moroccans in the last 500 metres. Oh, right. He the sport away. Yeah, he was doing the strides after his long run, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> If I look at myself, yeah, if you can win a, a, a world title as a kid and run that fast as a kid, you'd want to hang in and see what you do as a senior, but no. Yeah, I know. It always surprises Actually, well, I don't know if it surprises me or frustrates me when you see kids like that and then they just stop. They've got so much talent um, and they've obviously worked hard to get to that level, but then it's like, yeah, okay, what's next? And they're, they're like, they give up. How do you deal with that if, if that happens? Um, I mean, and why do they give up? Is it because they don't think there's a future in it for them and they've got to, you know, go elsewhere, mm. which is fair enough. I, I think there was a real good Australian girl last year um, and she went to world, so it would have been two years ago, world junior track and field, like really, really, like she would have made the final, but she's also very smart and she wants to be a doctor. So then you weighed up, like I'm a, I guess she didn't love it as much as we love running, so she chose med medicine over it. Um, yeah, I get frustrated because everybody doesn't love it as much as me. <laughs> yeah. When I left school, I I deliberately didn't go to university because I, I realised that to study well, I would need uh, funding, and my parents weren't wealthy, so I decided I'd work for a radio station, and that. Right. Funded That's the voice. Hey? 
you've got the voice. I knew it's a radio voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I, I didn't realize I had a radio voice. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's on a different path, aren't they, I guess? So it's hard to see what's right and what's wrong, wrong for everyone. Always learning, aren't we? Learning yeah. as we go. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. I just want to find out a bit more about your training with Harry Wilson. Now, you were from near Gateshead, or you're a Geordie, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. From the north. Yeah. Harry was based on um, top of the M25. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was it called? Well in Garden City. So I'd probably only see Harry once every six weeks unless there was a race in between. Um, and the girl I mentioned earlier, Kirsty Wade, we'd either go down there or he'd come up and see us for a session. So whenever we met up for a session, that was, you know, we got the most out of that session. Um, he would send my training by post. <laughs> I've still got some of them because I was showing the kids the other day. So he'd like send the training for the next, for those six weeks. And he like write little things in there, which was lovely. And you'd go and look at your training. <laughs> and then you'd have to ring up, tell them how you did. Um, so there was no watches or anything, obviously. So you just, it was honesty. Um, but, uh, and you'd be waiting. He, he would say you did well, but he was never like, oh, awesome, what have you. So if you did do really well, you knew you did well, because then you would get like, oh, very good. <laughs> and if he was satisfying okay all right so get ready for Thursday that was you know okay so I'm, I'm doing okay but what's interesting like I you know like when now that they, they have set paces when they go out if they're on the, the cross country or the road and they'll say all right I want this at 3 30 pace or what have you we would just have um what was it it was um easy easy steady hard and harder <laughs> so you just had to tune in you, you kind of knew what pace that meant yeah. Um, you didn't have the watches or anything, but it obviously worked because when you came to the races, you were getting the results. Um, so you just said, all right, so I've got to go hard, harder than hard today. <laughs> oh, interesting, yeah. So how hard did you go in the World Cross Country? Uh, I must have went pretty hard, yeah. I went too hard at the start because I think I was like in top five and I faded. Because what we he had the girl, he was second, Angela Toby. Then there was me, and he had the girl, our third counter, Susan Toby. She was to be in about 14. So I had um, had a good squad, mm. even though we didn't train together. It was an extended squad spread around England then. Yeah, yeah. And we'd get together, you know, when we go and meet Harry, we'd get together. But he didn't like Angela at first, Angela and myself training together because we like race. I guess because you were seeing Harry and you wanted to impress him and you didn't want her to get better. Well, he knew what it was all about, yeah. Yeah, oh no, no, he was, yeah, he could tell straight away, going, no, this isn't going to work, so, yeah, he separated. I just tell them the kids, uh, you know, like, uh, niggles, they've got to stay one step ahead of their body, if they, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, the fit, if they have a five days off, a week off, it doesn't matter, ro rather than run through an injury, because a lot of them think they've just got to, it's, something's tight, it's a, it's a warning, something's going to happen. Um, so I'm just trying to install that into them and most of them are getting on board like a couple of days off and then they're fine but if they run through something then they're right, they'll end up having like two, three weeks off yeah. um, less is more we were, you know, less is more that's very important and they've just got to believe in the process um, and not listen to too many outside influences there was a guy once told me um, you know you once, once you've got that trust in the coach, just stick with them because nobody else knows the full picture. They don't know. And I think the mental side is very important to get inside people's heads, knowing what they can and can't do and how they're going to cope with certain sessions. So just once you've got that trust and loyalty with somebody, you just go with it. Now, what advice would you have for a young Jill <laughs> who is starting over again from uh jill of today <laughs> well i say this all the time this afterwards stretching <laughs> if i had my time over again that's what i would do just the little things do the little things the stretching stretching and the conditioning you know that and um, look after your body yeah and don't another thing don't put people on pedestals we're all human yeah 
we're from Cairns and we'll go down to Brisbane and sometimes we're, we're changing now, but they'd go down there and they'd already think, oh, they're from Brisbane, so I'm going to, they're going to beat me and watch I mean, And then once they, once they meet them, they realise they're just human. Everybody's, everybody's got the same chance if they put the work in. Well, I remember running for Victoria and, and, or, and then we had the other way around. We'd go up to Brisbane and say, oh, they're just Queenslanders. And, uh... <laughs> oh, cause, yeah, they're just the Queenslanders. Yeah, so imagine then us, we go to Victoria, they'll be, oh, they'll be like, not now, but start now. It was very, actually, the first time I went to States here, yeah, me, I found it very nerve wracking, you know, like the the kids in the, I think the primary school's very hard for the kids to go through because there's a lot of, probably more the parents putting the pressure on the kids and then the, from the outside looking in, it's like, a bit scary. It's probably a bit young with nationals for 10 year olds. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, I think it's too young. Yeah. I think the ideal age is maybe mid-teens to get yeah. serious or start to get serious in, in the sport or even be running. I didn't start running until I was 17. Oh, um, really? Wow, that's so good. I, well, yeah. I, I have no idea, really. Oh, maybe 16 because uh -huh. the outer vista of my – well, now I'm talking about me, not you. But anyway, no, about you. Um, yeah, I didn't – get interested until 16, 17, because um, we had the great Commonwealth Games in New Zealand, which sparked everyone's imagination. Oh, know, yeah. Homegrown guys, you know, running world records and beating the Africans and all that. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So um, you have that sort of model to look at growing up. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. We, I did a lot of sports, but running was like my main one but still did a lot of other sports um but like nationals i wouldn't have gone to nationals until i was uh, oh well we would as a harriers but it, you know, yeah like 14 i guess we would have been, no, not as a 10 year old an awful lot can happen to a kid between 10 and say 16 17 18 exactly uh, and like you say you can flog a 10 year old and get them to win but then Who's that for? Is that for the who? Who's getting the glory? The kid for a short term, but may have a a good chin wag later on. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Awesome. You enjoy your Friday. Okay. Bye. <laughs> right, see ya. So, Jill, thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hi. Just as a postscript to that interview with uh, Jill Hunter, Jill Bowles, she really undersold herself. She was the World Cross Country Championships uh, top 10 placer on three occasions in 88, 89, and I think in 91. So, uh, and she says she's not world class. Uh, Commonwealth silver over 10,000 and uh, fastest woman of all time at one stage over uh, 25k road and second fastest over 10 miles road in the UK now to Paula Radcliffe who was very good um, but uh, how amazing you know you know that this lady's coaching in Cairns of all places and she says she wasn't world class but Cairns you've got someone world class right there so uh, make use of her 